Mariana, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a great, great pleasure to be here. You know, in seminars like this, what we love is we love to share success stories. And it's humane and it's inspiring. And because we want to feel there's hope and there's opportunities. And there is, and that's important. But, you know, equally important, I think, is to dig into, deep into what really matters. And that's not always a success story, not, not at first at least. Because even though there are great innovations and new strategies like we heard this morning, the truth is that people do care less about what we do and more about something else. And we call it a digital transformation, but we, we often avoid saying it means that they care about something else than what we do more. Um, it has to do with a trend I'm, all, I'm sure all of you know where everyone, any citizen, can become their own media. And people spend more time on Facebook than with the news. I'm sure you know this, but I just want to state it to start with. And they do prefer their friends' Facebook pages to ours. They trust a stranger's blog as much or more than what we do in our blogs. And to go even further, a Nielsen study stated just recently that in America, people trust news media less than web banner ads. Now, I find this a bit horrible, but with this in mind, I hope I can share something with you that will be useful and meaningful for you. I'm going to tell you why I recommend you let go of your biggest asset, that is your brand, and give it to the audience. The answer why you, why you should do that is not really what you think it might be. It's not because you want to get close to your audience or you want to be transparent or you want to create loyalty or, or stuff like that. That's important too, but that's not the reason why. Why should you let go of your brand? I'll tell you in just 10 seconds, but first I'm going to give you a case study from Finland, a country 3,000 kilometers from here. Um, Finland is a great place to make magazine experiments because it has the most magazines in the world per capita. It still has the most magazines all, after all these years, what has happened. So there are much, really, really a lot of magazines and a lot of competition. For example, my company, we're the smallest company in the whole market. So we, we, we're the challenger, we're the white guy here trying to punch the big guy. We have to be faster and more creative just to get our foot in the market. So this is Olivia, what I'm going to talk about today. today. It's a women's glossy and it's our fastest success. We launched it six years ago. It's a success in numbers and in fame. Here are some of the awards and prizes it has been nominated for and gotten, uh, just to show off a little how, like we do in seminars like this. <laughs> Always. Olivia is not the number one magazine in size in the country, not even close. But what, what has made it successful has to do with timing. We have been able to do things, new things, at the right time and often first. Like, for example, we launched like, shopping apps and Groupon types of offerings four years ago, acquired popular fashion blogs under our brand five, five years ago. We were the first ones to do that. So is that the secret of doing something right? Being the first, always. Not necessarily. Olivia combines top fashion glamour to ambitious and investigative feature journalism. Now that's quite bold and brave, that's nothing new. So maybe I think it's timing and bravery combined that matter. You know, a famous Vanity Fair editor-in-chief said, it's brains, balls, timing and style which make success. And I tend to believe that. It was about timing in this case I'm going to present to you and brains and balls too, because this is a story of how really pure print lovers created a digital tool for their audience, for a crowdsourcing tool for the readers to take over one issue of Olivia and build it online from start to finish. And it was an idea from our art director, a person who's not a digital person, she's not even on Facebook. This was in 2010, it was a time when 
Twitter was the new buzzword in journalism and crowdsourcing. You know, it was a time when Twitter users became the primary news sources in accidents and other crises. So the whole Olivia staff got really excited in designing and crafting the online crowdsourcing concept. But no one had done anything quite like it anywhere, anywhere we knew of. So no one knew how to do it. How to build a tool to build a magazine, a whole magazine online. And no IT wizards were involved. It was just us. Well, the very motive of the staff to do this was to get closer to the people they thought they already knew quite well. You, know, you see, Olivia gives voice to a specific generation and an attitude of 30 plus women. And to open a, this journalistic process to them was, of course, to make the brand stronger. And the method they created themselves was actually beyond what we call crowdsourcing. You know, in crowdsourcing, companies give the opportunity for people to come up with ideas to, to bring up something new, like Lego, for example. Lego is a company that's a great turnaround story. And the, one of the things they do online is they let everyone come up with an idea of a new Lego series. And if you get 10,000 thumbs up from Lego fans, the directors might consider it done. That's a bit different. Here we give the whole magazine for the audience. Or CNN iReport is a part in their website where you can, you, know, you can send in your own stories and they stay there, but they're not the real news. So this is, this is more open and more profound in system. It's called co-creation, not crowdsourcing. The staff interact online with the audience in a process that lasts for weeks. So Open Olivia is a structural model, and that means that there are lots of different parts. I'll show you how it works. It takes a lot of time, both from the staff and from the participators. And the first issue we created with this tool came out in January 2011. So by now, we have already done it three times, and the fourth is actually in the making. It comes out in December. So you can say fairly that co-creating has become a yearly routine with the staff. So here is how it works. The whole issue is divided into challenges and every story is a challenge. Like here, and a challenge is hosted by a staff member. Hosting means you know, bringing the discussion forward, introducing new ideas, guiding the discussion a little bit. Here um, we have the challenge on the main celebrity feature in Embry magazine, about eight pages. First, the crowdsourcing people give ideas. Who should it be this month? Then they discuss and choose five. Then voting takes place, you know, the pillars there to your right. They vote and that's the person. And then they come up with an angle. Why this person, actually a lesbian left-wing parliamentary representative that time, what is the angle to her now? What are the questions? And then there's a professional journalist who takes those questions, take that, takes that angle, makes the story, comes back. They see the story and then they come up with a headline. And this is how it looks in the magazine in the end. To give another example on the cover, first the participants choose a model. There are four different alternatives here. Then there is a photo shoot going on without participation. Then when it's ready, the participants, the co-creators choose the position. How should the model's hand be, hands be like? And that's the, that's the photo then on the cover. And then they go on to subtitle, to blurbs. What should be written on the, on the cover? Which title should be there? And then they choose the color of the title. So it's very, very detailed and it goes on and on and on deeper and deeper. And this is the final result in 2011. Well, you see, it involves a lot of work. So obviously, in order to get people to participate, you need to work on their rewards and prices. They don't do it just because they love Olivia, even though that is a primary, primary reason and motive for them. Anyone can influence, but the people who get rewards or prices have to make a profile with Facebook Connect. And from all activities, they of course get points, and points amount to top lists. They can see who, who has influenced most. They have letter boards and badges, like in Foursquare. 
So I, especially I like these four square badges because on the lowest level, after you, after you have participated some, you, you get an A, which is assistant level. And you can share it uh, in the social media or to anyone. And then if you really, really dig into it and participate all the time, you reach P there on the bottom. That's päätoimittaja, editor-in-chief in Finnish. And uh, after, after the first issue of Open Olivia came out, guess how many editors and chiefs the magazine had? 56. So this is why we have the slogan for Open Olivia that we have the biggest editorial staff in the country. Uh, that was so much more than we thought at first. We have to say we tried to make it hard so that only one or two people would achieve the edit uh, editor-in-chief level, but it didn't turn out that way. But of course, out of Olivia's 130,000 readers, only a very small part took part in this. You know, there's this 1% rule online. It means that if you have 100 persons online, one gives you content, 10 comments on it, and the rest just view it. This is what happened to us as well, even though we did a little bit better than 1%. Best weeks, this tool has had 5,000 unique uh, users, and worst week, around 2,000. Well, for our advertisers, Open Olivia offers quite a nice range of opportunities. They can host their own challenges, which end up as advertorials in the magazine. Here, there's a um, campaign crowdsourcing challenge. A company asks who is a good leading figure for this campaign. Another comp this is actually going on right now in the o Open Olivia process they're making at the moment for December. Another one that is going is from Alpro, a soy uh, company who's looking for recipes for soy and, and giving prizes to the best one. And in the ad, ad challenges, it is the representative of the advertiser who is the host, not the editorial staff. Now this woman, she is Tanya Aitamurto, who was the project leader in the first Open Olivia. She used this process as a case study in her thesis on crowdsourcing she did for Stanford University. So from the first Open Olivia process, we got valid academic research material, which we used to improve the tool. And it was very useful and quite surprising, I'll tell you in a moment. Tanya interviewed a bunch of active co-creators. She found out that participation in the project created ownership and responsibility of the brand. The people who participated felt privileged and excited to see the outcome, the printed magazine. It was an empowering experience for them, and it did increase loyalty. Well, then <laughs> there is the surprise. The outcome was disappointing for both the journalists and the participants. The first open Olivia issue was just more boring than a regular one. This is what I thought, this is what the participants thought, this is what uh, the journalists thought. The journalists had given, because they wanted to be so democratic and so open, they in the end had given too much space for the co-creators. And the co-creators said, we want you to do your, your job in the end. Don't listen to us too much in the wrong way. We don't want to read a more boring Olivia. That was, that was a surprise and very, very useful. So the staff has since then learned how to integrate this process better into the concept. So it comes out as a strong brand rather than a compromise. Open Olivia has been a good sales argument for us. You know, we do it intentionally every year on a slow season, like in January or in December, and it sells better than a regular issue in ads in January or December. It performs really well on newsstands, and we're very happy about it. It's great PR, and it has, it has been important for the staff as well. But, there is a but. The people who engage in Open Olivia are Olivia's readers already, or a fraction of it. You know, Olivia's subscriber loyalty has just recently improved, but is it because of this? Maybe, partly, we don't really know. This is a great thing to do, but it won't change our destiny. The first speaker said today very nicely that community is the new content. It is, but it's not automatically that. 
you, if you learn how to transform it into it, it will become it. This is a long process, and this, what we did, is just the first step. We probably need a thousand. But coming back to you, why should you still do it, in my mind? Why do I recommend that you give away your brand, your biggest asset, to a bunch of strangers? Well, letting go of the brand is one way of quoting the first speaker today, learning to love the lack of control. In other words, it's one way of getting your mind onto another track. And we need it because the rest of the world is not automatically as thrilled as we are. Every time we do something we think is magnificent and wonderful, we have new gimmicks and everything fun, they don't probably care all that much. We need to let the audience change us if we want them to pay attention. The selfie generation here, for example, the ones who photograph themselves all the time. Why should they pay attention or pay for what we do? They are their own media. Like this Swedish blogger Isabella, Isabella Löwengrip with three million unique visitors a week. And yes, she was a millionaire at 17, now she's 22 and owning six different businesses and you name what. Or this makeup tutorial teen celebrity on YouTube having four million views on herself doing a prom night makeup. We need to let the audience change us because the challengers multiply themselves all the time. It is not only about Google or iTunes forming our industry, it is about guys like this who just know, he knew nothing about women's magazines or women's web content, con anything, anything. He was outside the market and he just established a women's website called Bustle because he thought it needed to be done because no one was doing it. So, to reach outside the box, to innovate in a meaningful and business-wise way, to enjoy the lack of control, you need to lose yourself for a while. Let your audience change you. You can do it by giving your brand away to your audience. That's just one way. You can come up with something else. Just do it and think about the timing. Thank you.